So I was shopping for some workout clothes at TJ Maxx last week, and look what I found. It's the Timberwolves shirt. <laughs> With the trinity of Gobert, Edwards, and Anthony Towns. I probably would have put Reed and McDaniels. McDaniels does not get enough credit. Anyhow, all the other ones are within there. I just thought, well, this is kind of spirit-led, isn't it? Because I knew I was going to preach about the Timberwolves today, and I got a visual to go with it. I don't really think that's how the spirit works, but it was a nice coincidence. So, that what is true as Jesus in this Nicodemus story and John points out, the spirit blows whither it will. And that reminds us, since Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, that if we can't control the Holy Spirit, neither can we control God, whom we know in Jesus, nor God whom we know as creator, or as Romans says, God whom we have an intimate enough connection to that we can call Abba. This holy three and one and one and three whom we worship will move how and where God will move. Wasn't that part of why Jesus was put to death? No one could control him. He wouldn't fall in line. He wouldn't stick to the script others wanted to give him, whether that was the Roman authorities like Pilate, the Jewish authorities like Herod and the temple leaders, or the script his own disciples and others of his followers wanted to give him. The Trinitarian God moves whither they will. Part of why I was drawn to this sculpture of Wilmer's, which I did purchase, is because it reminded me of the spirit, the freedom expressed, like the dance of the Trinity song we just sang, just freedom and joy. I was like, that's the spirit. And guess what? It's named Windy. And in Greek, in today's Nicodemus story, the same word is translated breath, wind, or spirit. The wind blows whither it will, the breath blows whither it will, the spirit blows whither it will. That might be another Holy Spirit moment because Wilmer did not know that connection and I did not know the sculpture was called Windy. So back to the Timberwolves. <laughs> and what do they have to do with the Trinity? I think we could say they didn't stick to the script in that last series. They were supposed to lose to the defending champs, especially after losing three straight and being down in the third quarter by 20. But most of all, they played as a team. They had six players in that game in double digits. No hot dogging, no playing the savior, no one or two players carrying the team on their backs. Like this image of a circle on the t-shirt, no beginning, no end, no first, no last, and the mystery of cohesiveness when all play as one. If you watch or play sports, or perhaps you prefer the orchestra or choir, Sometimes everything just comes together and we are carried beyond ourselves if we are participating or we are carried into the beauty and mystery of it if we are watchers or listeners. We use the phrase team spirit to mean like rah-rah, but watching game seven of the second round of the Western playoffs there was a spirit amidst the players playing as one where everything worked. And you just wonder, how does that happen? 
Murray and Jokic of the Nuggets in that game were a two-man team. They lost. And of course, there are superstars who can do that, who can carry the team, and those two superstars often can and do. And that fits our cultural script. We like the hero story. We like the individual who, against all odds, can succeed. We love those movies about the coach or the teacher who makes, takes a ragtag team or a classroom full of kids others have given up on and makes them winners. We focus on the coach, the teacher who made the difference. I always think, well, that proves that if we ensured that all kids had what they needed to succeed, they could and they would. If we thought and acted communally, what if we thought of all kids as our kids, like our God does? But we root and vote for the person who says, I'll fix it. In New York, when I was there, the Synod voted for the guy for bishop who promised that. The guy who said it's a team effort lost. He was the better candidate. He, acknowledging that it was about our working together, had the healthier, stronger ego. In case you're thinking, that's just your opinion, Pastor Diane, the one who won later was relieved of his position. But in our individualistic, star-studded culture, we like the hero, the fix-it person. I remember reading Parting the Waters, the first volume of Taylor Branch's trilogy on the civil rights movement, described by one reviewer, while Dr. King looms large, he was not the entire show. To that end, Parting the Waters can more accurately be described as the biography of the crusade rather than of an individual. That is something that stuck with me from that book, which I read probably 20 years ago. Some of the civil rights leaders didn't want King to come to town because they had a grassroots organization, a grassroots team of leaders, and they were afraid if, they, if King came, they would be disempowered, that they too would look to the individual who would come and go and fix it. Congregations can look at pastors that way, and some pastors take on that role. But a pastor is part of a team, or maybe more apt, a pastor is a coach, and the congregation is the team. I always say it's important that enough people feel a connection to the pastor, that they like and trust the pastor, and are engaged and fed by the sermons, but the thriving of a community is about the community, the team effort, the team spirit. It's about everyone playing a role as the spirit enables. That maybe is especially true now when I was going to say people are rejecting authority figures and have been for a while. Certainly I've heard young people say, why would why would I go to church and listen to one person's interpretation of scripture when I can go online and listen to a bunch and choose? Why give that power to one person? Which is why I always say a sermon is just the beginning of a conversation. But isn't it interesting that all over the world in this supposedly anti-institutional, anti-authoritarian time, Countries are electing authoritarian figures who tell the populace they will fix everything and it's not their fault, it's someone else's and they will take care of it. Hmm. But over against all of these human tendencies, there is the community of Father, Son, and Spirit creator, savior, sustainer. There is this trinity, the community of God, God, the original they. 
Here exists a critique of our individualistic hero culture. But here also is an invitation and a gift. Our inheritance, Paul calls it. We are gifted inclusion into this Trinitarian life, baptized into, gathered into the community of God and into the communion of saints gathered from every time and every place. We are not alone. We do not have to go it alone. As a matter of fact, no one can and no one does in spite of the cliched self-made man. We need one another. If God who creates needs God who saves, needs God who empowers, how would it be true that we can go it alone? We are given this inheritance, not abandoned, but adopted into the family of God where we are given freedom to live and to serve and a community to live and serve beside and within. A young couple who has visited us off and on over the last year or so showed up last week and said, we want to join this church. We have been visiting other churches and always seem to come back here. What is that if not the spirit of God drawn here like Nicodemus was drawn to Jesus. I think of all our guests and visitors as gifts of the spirit to be tended to. It's part of our mission statement, gathering in community. Yes, it means getting together in community, but it also means gathering others around this table, around this font, around this word, that reminds them and us, we are not alone, but we are inheritors and sharers of this great communion of grace. In the name of the Holy One in three, three in one. Amen. <laughs>